where does the power to be an artist actually come from and what's it about? We tend to think in the modern world that artists have emotions, they have some artistic skill, and they decide, I'm going to express myself. But another way to think about this is that any power that a human being has actually is a share in God's own power. So any work that human beings do is actually a participation in what we could call the work of God. Now God, not being human, not being in the temporal order, doesn't work and labor in the sense that we do. But God created the world in six days, and it's easy to forget that creation didn't end on the sixth day, even though God rested on the seventh day and looked and saw that it was good. And in fact, in Greek, the word is good, beautiful. It's a hyphenated word. It was good and beautiful, but creation didn't end in that moment. It's not that in the sixth day creation was done and everything went on because people are yet to be born and the world has to be brought to the glorification that God wants it to have. So just as he left the church to continue the mission of Christ, so he left artists to continue the work of creation. This notion of the continuing action of God in the world, this continuing creation, comes from John 5.17, where Christ himself says, I too must be at work. My Father has never ceased working, and I too must be at work. So all human activity, all human work, particularly the work of artists, is somehow a participation in God's own self-revelation. He allows us to participate, and then when we see this beauty, we delight in it as well, and are led back to God. Now all of human activity can be seen in this way. A physician participates in Christ's healing power. A priest participates in Christ's own priesthood. But when we're talking about artists, we can look at a couple of things, basic ideas. First, a potter, right? someone who takes clay and makes something out of it, just as God took the dust of the earth and made Adam. In other words, dust was a kind of primordial chaos. The earth was formless. It had matter, existence, but it was formless, and God had to give it order. Now. Think of that out by extension to a potter who takes clay, which comes in a bag as a formless lump. And imitating the processes of God impresses himself or herself, his mind, his thoughts, and his hands, and gives shape to this formless matter. So if we can participate at that level, then the highest call would be try to imitate as much as possible the perfected entering into the word, the organizing principle of God, and make matter from chaos into cosmos, which is order and reveal God to the world. Here is the high call of the artist. In a similar way, deep in the tradition, something like weaving, something fundamental, like making clothing to wear, is also seen as a share in God's creative power. The vertical lines of the woven fabric indicate the connection between heaven and earth. That's the idea that comes down from God. Then the horizontal lines in the weaving represent existence. So the up and down, the connection of God and humanity then intersect with the horizontality of creation to make this wonderful tapestry of glorious revelation, again, of God's power. So the potter takes chaos and makes something. The weaver takes a pile of strings, which are also chaos, and makes something. And it's useful for our existence as human beings, but also can be brought to the glory of God, like a wonderful chasuble or some liturgical vestment that would reveal creation and God's own descending love for us, becoming this radiant and splendid thing that we can delight in and will lead us back to God in the liturgy. Now this capacity for human beings to share in the creative power of God extends out even to buildings. If you think about God as the order giver to the universe, that he took matter and built something three-dimensional, there's something contained in it. It has the heaven as the roof, it has the earth as the ground, and everything in between is where we dwell. So God is often seen as an architect in medieval cathedrals. He's be shown with a little architect square doing the work of designing the world, and then the church building becomes the image of that. So what people can claim is that architecture is not something that arises up from us exclusively, but our share in God's capacity to give us the roof of heaven over our heads, protection, the ground as a place of foundation, and then the space in between, which is the created order where God and humanity interact with each other. And this is why the church building, or the Temple of Solomon in scripture, is a little microcosm. It's a little version of the world. Heaven connects to earth and gives us a place to walk around in delight with God, very much like Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden. Now, if you take that image of the architectural house even a little further, think of the house of God. Think of the idea of Christ's body being compared to the temple. This is where God and humanity dwells. This is what a temple is. And so for the whole world to be seen as an imitation of Christ who took humanity and divinity, in other words, creation and the creator, and wed them to each other in this wedding feast of the Lamb, we can then say the church building is at the highest level of God wanting to share himself with us as the architect, his son, Christ, being the body, 
that has many parts assembled, just like a building where humanity and divinity dwell together in perfect relationship. And so the architect's call is to make buildings that do that, that reinforce the order of the city, of the home, of the family, of the church, and then ultimately to allow the heavenly glory of the existence of God's own place, heaven, to interact with our earthly place and heaven and earth become one, just as Christ's humanity and divinity became one. It's not an accident that God chose his only son to be a carpenter. Now the architect or the stonemason in traditional iconography was associated with the creator, the maker of something from nothing. The carpenter was the one who was the restorer, the remaker. Just as Noah was good with wood and built the ark so that he could be the founder of the new world, so Christ would come and work with wood and be the founder of the new world. Now trees are particularly interesting. Very much like the weaver, they have branches that correspond to being connected to heaven and then this vertical trunk that's often compared to an umbilical cord between heaven and earth and then that roots that penetrate deep into the world. So wood is the special thing that Christ, of course, died on a tree. The tree was the place of the downfall of Adam and Eve and then the world was restored through the tree. So the carpenter, the one who knew how to work with wood, became the one who restored the world that fell through a tree, restores the great fall that happens through a tree by being nailed on a tree, becoming the true fruit, healthy fruit that undid the poisonous fruit of Adam and Eve. And this kind of thinking gives all the arts a theological underpinning. A maker of images takes matter, dirt of the earth, pigments, makes an image of a saint or an angel or a vision of a perfected world. So there's many ways that the artist can serve the purposes of God in this continuing act of creation. The challenge is, do we remember that? Do artists know that their job is to surrender to the divine power of the Holy Spirit, to inspire them to use the things of the earth, to imitate God the Father, and continue the process of creation by way of participation in God's plan? God could have said, hey, I did it and you're done, but instead he allows us to delight in the process of our own glorification of the world and sanctification of everything. And this is the task, the priest's task, offer things to God, share in his divine power. The prophet's task, teach, learn, understand. And then the king's task, to govern and to render justice and harmony to the world. So the job of the artist, as it is to any person on earth who works in any way, is to say, how can I use my craft to continue this process of creation, to bring the world closer to the eschaton, that's the world as God wants it to be, and therefore find my vocation in the world as a contributor working together with God to bring his glory to the world.